free will and Sam Harris's and others' ideas of its non-existence? Well, that's a good complicated question to kick things off. So I want to tell you a little bit about how to conceptualize free will, I think, first, because it's obvious that we don't have infinite free will. Our, our choice our choices are constrained in all sorts of ways. And I think part of the reason that there's a, a continual discussion about free will in the philosophical <laughs> in the philosophical literature is because just conceptualizing the issue properly is extraordinarily difficult. So I like to think about it, at least in part, the way that you think about a game. You know, if you're playing a game, obviously the game has rules. So if it's a chess game or a basketball game, then there are things that you can do and, th and things that you can't do. And, but, and so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a closed world in some sense. But the fact that there are things you can't do when you play a game also seem to open up a universe of possibilities for things that you can do. So chess obviously constrains you to a board and to a certain number of men and to a certain pattern of rules. But the strange thing is, is that when you put in those rules, because rules sound like limits, they sound always like things you can't do. But when you set up a constrained world like that and you lay out a system of rules, what you do is open up an infinity of, of a near infinity of possibilities. Same with music, you know, music has rules, obviously. And, and if you follow the rules, then you can make an infinite variety of music. And so, and so there's a, there's a very interesting dynamic that's hard to understand between constraint and possibility. And there's a deep idea that's associated with that that I read in some Jewish commentary on, on the biblical stories that I, I read a long time ago, um, talking about the relationship between God and man. And the idea was that God, imagine a being with the classical attributes of God, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful. What does a being like that lack? And obviously the answer is nothing, right? Because by definition, those three traits provide for absence of limitation. But then that's exactly what's lacking, is limitation. And there's some strange connection between limitation, and, and I was saying, say, limitation that, that's rule-governed, as I mentioned before, and the opening up of possibility. So... It isn't necessarily the case that now determin determinism and limitation aren't exactly the same thing, but they're analogous and they need to be discussed together. Okay, so now, so that's the first thing is that our, whatever our free choice is, it isn't limited. It's, or it's limited. It's, it's deeply limited. Now, here's another thing. If I take my arm and I go like this, you see, I'll do that again. Now, you see, there's a movement like that. And then my hand stopped just before my, my other hand. Now, it takes a certain amount of time for the neural messages to go from my brain to my arm and back. And the time it takes my hand to go like this and stop is actually shorter than the time it takes a message to get to my brain and back. So what that means is that when I, when I plan this movement, which is called a ballistic movement, it's called a ballistic movement because it's like a bullet. Once you let it go, it's gone. There's no calling it back. I've actually organized the neurological and muscular sequences that enable that action before it's implemented. I set all that up and then it's released and the whole thing cascades. And so once the action has been released, let's say, then I don't really have any free will because I can't stop it. Now, so, so you think about that. It looks like there's a temporal gradient with regards to free will is that as you look out into the future, May, perhaps the farther out you look into the future, um, the farther down the road, let's say, the more free your choices are. But the closer they get to implementation, the more they become deterministic, governed by standard causal processes. And there's some transition point where they change from being what we would describe as choice, that we haven't got to free choice yet, but at least to choice. There's some transition point between that and ballistic movement. Here's another way of thinking about it. Like we know, for example, that people who are expert at playing the piano look ahead of where they're playing. And, and they're doing the same thing. They're watching the notes. They're seeing where they're going. But, and then they're disinhibiting the automated structures that enable them to play what they've practiced so thoroughly. They're disinhibiting those structures. And then they go automatically. And then what happens if you make a mistake is that consciousness notes the error and then unpacks the 
motor sequences that have been practiced. And then you repractice them and sequence them again until they become automatic and deterministic. So there's choice in that you're reading ahead, but there's no choice in that once you've read ahead and disinhibited the actions, then they run ballistically. And then you can think about the same thing that's happening when you're driving in a car. You don't look right in front of you when you're driving a car because whatever is right in front of you, if you're going 40 miles an hour or whatever, you've already run over. You look a quarter of a mile down the road and that gives you the opportunity to see what's coming and to set up a sequence of increasingly automated movements that culminate in whatever it is that you're doing while you're driving. And so there's a gradation from choice to determinism, a temporal gradation. And, and I, I don't often see that addressed when people talk about free will.